You know, it's hard to do. Nick, are you going to include my, my lunch as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. Good to be. Is my in the picture? Famous. Am I in the picture? I hope not. No, <laughs> just your food. But don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> if you speak, you'll be in the picture. Correct. <laughs> well, anyway, greetings to uh, today's MBL lecture, and um, I will be introducing our speaker in just a second. Um, my apologies. Um, I uh, got the announcement out for this late, due in part because I've just been back at work after being two weeks away. But anyway, what we are doing is recording this lecture, and we will make it widely available on YouTube. Um, so do uh, pay attention to that. Uh, in terms of our normal practice, I just wanted to note two books that are now have just recently been produced by Regnum Books that you might be interested. The first one is Islam and Women, Hagar's Heritage. And this is written by Myra Dale. And the other new uh, publication out is Complexities of Theologies of Wealth and Prosperity, Africa in Focus. And this is Bosella and E. 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 Loke. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. We need Tim for that. There we go. Jige. So those are two uh, books that were just handed to me in terms of new works at Regnum. And again, Regnum is really producing a great amount of excellent works internationally that are putting forward the work of OCMS scholars and, and scholars related to OCMS in various regards. So um, I'm going to turn off my stuff here for a second. And then we're going to go to um, Let's, um, yeah, I think we're in the right place here and we are being recorded. All right, our um, speaker today is our own uh, alumnus of OCMS, Tim Wambunya. And Tim is currently the Honorary Assistant Bishop in the Diocese of Oxford and incumbent at St. Paul's Slough. Slough? Slough. 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 Before that, he was a Crosslinks mission partner in Kenya, where he served as Diocesan Bishop of Butera in Western Kenya and previously principal of the Church Army Africa Carlisle College for Business and Theology in Nairobi. He also served as the regional director for East Africa in Bible League International. He was visiting lecturer on the DMIN PhD course at Uganda Christian University, where he specialized in congregational development. Now, before you start, I want to make sure you are in. Is that right? Um, why isn't this? So I just want to make sure that we are. Um, here we go. And so, with that, Tim, I will turn it over to you for your lecture. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Terry, and, and and thank you for inviting me as well. Oh, <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom. Well, Terry's up there. Actually. Terry's up there. Yeah. Hey, Terry. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really nice to be back again at, um, at all CMS after so many years. Um, it's always a joy to be back, and so I'm really pleased that um, uh, you've invited me to come and, and give this this uh, lecture today. Uh, my 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 topic or the purpose of my my lecture really is to inform all of us who are here today of the state of the Anglican Church in the UK and especially the provinces of Canterbury uh, and and York. Uh, we've left out um, Wales and 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 uh, and Scotland, but we're going to look at um, the state of the Anglican Church in the UK, the provinces of York, and and and, uh, and Canterbury. And really, my, my idea is, is that uh, this is very provocative. Is that uh, I I I I am saying that um, the Church of England, as we know it today, in the provinces of of Canterbury and 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 York, 
could be completely wiped out in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, that was my title uh, earlier on uh, this week, but uh, when I was looking at it last night, I thought maybe not 20 to 30 years, but 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be looking at um, uh, the mission, parish finance, and the ministry statistics that are produced by the Church of England for the year 2020. And then we're going to uh, do a comparison with the uh, mission statistics for the last 10 years from 2008 to 2018. And by looking at those statistics, we will see that everything about that statistics, those statistics tell us that the Church of England is in rapid decline. And therefore, if you extrapolate the information you have there, the, the figures that you have there, then you will have no church uh, in 20, uh, in 15 to 20 years from now. So let me, let me begin by just um, telling you an African proverb. Uh, as you know, my PhD here was on the collection and study of proverbs, but I'd like just to share with you an African proverb. It's an African proverb, an international proverb, uh, but some people would say it's a Dutch proverb because we see uh, it in some writings by uh, Dutch scholars from as early as the 16th century, and even was quoted by one US governor uh, and a few years ago, and he said the proverb was a Greek proverb. But the proverb says, a fish rots from the head down. A fish rots from the head down. And so uh, this is to suggest that um, in any organization, that in addition to uh, leadership being very important, that those who are in leadership determine whether the organization prospers or does not prosper. And so when we apply that to the uh, Church of England, then we have our archbishops and we have the bishops of the Church of England. And so they are the fish that we're talking about in this particular instance. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to, in a sense, um, undermine the efforts of our current Archbishop of Canterbury or the uh, the current Archbishop of, of, of York, I think they're doing a tremendous job in impossible circumstances. But I just want to say that um, if the Church of England is going to prosper or is going to survive the next 15 to 20 years, then we really need to be looking again how we get people into those positions and how we ensure that they maintain their focus on mission issues. And I just think in the last 10, 20, 30 years that the Church of England has lost its focus a little bit and has uh, has allowed itself to be controlled by what I would call irrelevant issues that mean that people who get into those positions of authority, of leadership, are not really concerned with the progression or survival or prospering of the Church of England, but are more concerned about the maintenance. And there's less and less to maintain now. And that is why I say, um, that in another 15 or 20 years, uh, we may not have a Church of England again or at all. So one of the things that I, I think has been a big issue is that we now have uh, people in leadership who are losing touch or, or have failed to connect with the traditional connecting points in the Church of England in terms of allowing scripture to have its final authority in the decisions we make, uh, and, and just staying focused on what we think as a church we should be doing. There are now so many issues or so many determining issues as to how one becomes uh, a bishop in the Church of England that it is no, no longer relevant, it seems, that you should have somebody who has the interest of prospering or, or growing the Church of England. And that's why I say, the fish rots from the head down, and we need to look at that if we're really to disprove my central idea of the church dying in the next 15 or 20 years. I just want to tell you a bit about myself before I continue. Um, I was a student here once upon a time, but a long serving student. I wanted to say a long suffering student, but a long serving student <laughs> <laughs> in Austria. So I enjoyed my time here, it was a very long time, it took, took about seven years to do my. my um, my, finished my PhD, and um, and then I went on to do several other jobs, and I really am grateful for the kind of study that I had here at OCMS. But I'm also 
a student in my own right and a scholar. So I believe that uh, being a student doesn't end with uh, finishing your PhD, that we continue being students and scholars, especially if we want to be involved in mission. I've also published a few books uh, and the most significant one that I've published in the last uh, two years was to do what I call the big issues affecting the church in Kenya. And so uh, it's a huge volume, about 600 pages, where I talked about the big, big issues that I thought were affecting the <laughs> church in Kenya. I'm also a mission a practitioner, so I'm just not just talking about things from an academic point of view, but I, I'm involved in mission. I have been involved in mission for a long, long time. And in my current position, I'm not only a bishop, but I'm also a parish maker. So I'm holding sort of two uh, concurrent jobs that mean that I have to be sort of on the cutting edge of, of mission. And so I know how it feels to be involved in mission. And I know what is required in order to succeed in mission. So my central idea again is that if the way, looking at the statistics that we have now for the Church of England, that this church could be completely wiped out uh, in the next 15 or 20 years. And I speak not only as a person who's involved in this mission itself, but one who's a day into the Church of England. So I'm not just an outsider who comes to um, con condemn or, or point fingers at what's going on in the Church of England. Yes, I've been away for about 12 years uh, as a mission partner abroad. But uh, I am now involved again uh, in mission. And sometimes it's easier when you come in from the outside to see, because they say uh, a new broom sweeps, um, clean, you know, what is, a new broom uh, uh, sweeps better or, or, or is able to sweep all those corners that nobody else would see. And so I see things now in the Church of England that I would not probably have seen if I had stayed on in the Church of England for the last 12 years. The ministry terrain, the mission terrain has completely changed in the last 12 years that I've been away, but I recognize that there is a huge challenge ahead for us. So I want to use the Church of England statistics, if you like. Uh, this is statistics that are produced by the Church of England every year. And the Church of England produces what you call statistics for mission, and they have both statistics for, for finance as well. And then they have ministry statistics, and then I'm going to do a comparison to see what the, how the church has declined in, in the last 10 years. And the latest statistics of the Church of England have prepared or has published were published in the autumn of 2021, mm -hmm. and um, and the next ones are due in the autumn in in, in sort of mid 2022. But now let's look at the latest statistics which the Church of England has produced. I'm going to read them out for you because I'm not quite sure I could sort of project them out for you when I didn't have permission from <laughs> writers of this report um, to do that. We need to say, in terms of just getting some background on, um, on this report, we need to remember that um, the last 18 months have been very difficult for the church in, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we need to know that the church has struggled in various ways, that there have been different ways of doing church that uh, not many people have been coming to church, but there have been others who've attended church uh, online and through other means as well. But we need to note that as we look at the statistics and factor in all that as we talk about the decline and all that. So uh, just to say what the statistics say to us generally, and you, you, you may be able to find the statistics as well if you, if you want to look at them more closely yourself, and you can do that by going to the Church of England uh, website and they have those reports as attachments there. Um, we just need to say that generally speaking, the last um, 18 months that the majority of Church of England churches have offered what you call home services. In other words, uh, you were able to uh, uh, tune in to your services or church service from home. And 75, 78% of churches were able to do that. 91% uh, of churches were able to offer both um, a, a live service in church, but also uh, a, a service uh, online. And this has continued. And, and some people say that now that people have got used to 
uh, this whole online kind of service. It's going to be very hard to get them back again into normal uh, church worship and coming to the building. So there's a huge change there, sometimes to our disadvantage, because people who stopped coming to church will find it very hard to go back again to church. They found other things to do, and therefore that in itself has worsened the decline, if you like, of the Church of England, because people have taken that space that they used to have on Sunday mornings and given it to sports or to, to shopping or to just lying in bed and not doing anything serious. So in summary, this is what the statistics say to us. Uh, and we're looking at what we're calling the statistics for mission. It say, they say to us that overall in the last year, that the electoral roll uh, decreased by 1%. Doesn't look very bad from that point of view when you think 1%. Yes, people die, people are born, not everybody who's born becomes a member of the Church of England. But then if you think that the electoral roll is not updated generally for about three to six years, then you begin to see that there's a lot of dead people on that electoral roll who, who are still there, who are still being counted, and yet do not exist as members of the Church of England. But there was a decline of, of 1% uh, in the electoral roll. Uh, there was a decline of 7% in the worshiping community generally. There was a decline of 57% uh, in terms of adults who were worshiping weekly in our churches, a decline of 77% amongst children who worshiped in our churches. Uh, the Sunday attendance in itself declined by 56%. Children, average Sunday attendance declined by 74%. Christmas attendance, which is usually the highlight of the year when everybody who's never been to church decides that they must come to church, uh, there was a decline in the Christmas service of 79%. The Advent service, which is another big one as well, a decline of 78%. Um, other school services that would normally be associated with schools at Advent, there was a decline of 97%. Baptisms declined by 81%. Wow. Marriages and services of prayer and dedication declined by 71%. Funerals in church. Declined, declined by 35%, not enough people dying as well. Funeral cremations uh, declined, no, increased by uh, 48%. And the total, if you count the funerals in church and funerals in, in the crematorium, those declined by 4%. So theoretically, because of that small decline in funerals, numbers should be going up. But even with that sort of minor decline, if you like, in funeral services, you, you have um, the numbers are still declining, which for me paints to a very uh, big crisis in terms of, of numbers in the church. If you look at the average size of churches in the last year, the average size of churches, I mean, the churches that have 500 people and the others that have 10 people, the average size of, of, of churches in the Church of England or congregations has decreased from 76 people to 70 people. The average weekly attendance in all churches has decreased from 58 people to 23 people. Children attending church uh, weekly has decreased from 8.3%, I don't know how you get a 0.3% child, but at 8.3% to 1.9%. Christmas attendance has decreased from 159 people to 34 people. That's how small Christmas services have become. Baptism and Thanksgivings has decreased from 6.2 people to 1.2 people. Marriages and services of prayer and dedication have decreased from 2.1 people or, or, or marriages to 0 0.6 uh, marriages. I don't know how you get a 0 0.6 marriage, but yes, now you can come to Church of England and get a 0 0.6 marriage 
come back again the following year and get the other bit that's missing. Funerals in churches have decreased from eight average on average to 7.7. So wherever you look, it's a story of decline and decline. If you then look at the places that have, looking at the various dioceses across the UK, you look, you look at the um, places where you had an increase in funerals, you will find that this, this areas so or this diocese have been predominantly the ones that you have what you call a UK minority ethnic congregations. And the UK minority ethnic congregations tend to be the sort of more faithful and more loyal uh, church attenders in the Church of England, especially those who come in from the colonies. They all tend to come to the Church of England and therefore tend to raise the numbers quite significantly. But they have been more deaths amongst the uh, UK ME people in those dioceses that have a predominant UK ME population. So if you look at the dioceses of Birmingham and Blackburn, you look at Leicester, you look at Liverpool, you look at London and Manchester, this is where you have had the highest number of UK ME people dying or having funerals in church. So that again is just telling you how serious this decline is and how quickly it's moving. So, for example, in Birmingham, the number of UKME funerals went up by about 110%. In Blackburn, uh, you had about 100% increase. In Leicester, you had about 100% increase. Uh, in London and Manchester, you had about 115% increase. This is all working very hard to show how. Um, the numbers are declining and continue to decline. If you look at uh, uh, Birmingham, for example, uh, you will see that in terms of how many parishes reported their statistics for this, this study, you'll find that it's 85% of them. Uh, so uh, suggesting that, that, you know, it was a significant percentage, if you like. I mean, we go for 100%, but only 85% reported. And, and that just goes to show how, how serious this whole uh, decline is in, in the various dioceses. Those are just some of the, uh, what are called mission statistics that again, point to only a negative picture in terms of, of the numbers and they're only declining and going down and down. Now, if you look at the finance, which is another area that you can use to measure whether the church is growing or whether it's declining, you look, you look at the various statistics that we have, and you look at a 10-year, uh, if you look, take the 10-year picture of the finances uh, in the Church of England, in the year 2000, the average uh, income or the total income in all the parishes in, in the Church of England was about 900 million. 10 years on, in 2020, it's about 900 million again. So the finances stay the same. That's not a sign of growth. It's quite frightening, actually, because we know that, that the givers in the Church of England tend to be the older members of the congregation. So the older you get, the more likely you are to give to the Church of England and to support its work. So that has sort of remained more or less steady over the years. But if you look at the 10 year span, you're still at the same place you were uh, 10 years ago. To be precise, you, in 2000, the total income in all the churches, the Church of England, was 927 million, and in the year 2020, it's 924 million. So not a very good picture there. You'd expect that um, you'd be talking a bit, uh, maybe um, at, at two billion by now over 10 years, if the increase was to you know, uh, grow, if, if the income was to grow, but you're right at the same place you were uh, in the year at 2010, 20 years on. So the giving itself has decreased by something like uh, in the last year alone, giving to the Church of England has decreased by approximately 40%. But even worse, uh, giving to mission, which is what you need in order to do the work and to grow the church, that has decreased by approximately 
at 20%. Our expenditure on mission has decreased by 51%. So we're not only uh, trying to grow the church, but we're trying more and more to, to reduce the amount of investment we have in mission. So wherever you look, if you look at the overview of the way people have given, which is an indication of declining numbers as well and declining wealth, as people retire from their jobs and, and die off and, and stop giving. If you look at the planned giving 10 years ago, uh, the average planned giving uh, in the Church of England was 12 pounds a week. Not very good, actually, if you think about the wealth in, in the Church of England or in England generally. Now, it is eight pounds a week. So that has really, really declined over the last 10 years. Everywhere you look, you see decline uh, in, in, uh, in the money. You also see decline in the figures and in the attendance. If you look at the ministry statistics, the, the only good thing that, that you might be able to discover is that ministry statistics, which is people who've been ordained and are serving in the Church of England uh, in full-time ministry, is that the number of women candidates being ordained has increased, which is a good thing. As an African bishop, I'll tell you that um, the, the, the backbone of the church in Africa is really the women, not the men. And if you, if you give up on the women, then the church will die. And maybe that's the only positive signal we have now in the church of England, that you have more, more women coming in to, um, to do ministry. Uh, and if you analyze the figures even more, you see that uh, uh, you, have, you have more women coming in as self-supporting. In other words, they're not expecting a stipend, but uh, are just willing to give uh, their, their resources to, to do mission in the Church of England. So that's the one positive thing that we want to say, that, that we'll probably just try and slow down the decline of the Church of England. Then a, another bad signal that we get is that the average age of, um, of, of the ordained minister of the Church of England is between 55 to 59. That's the average age of, of your ministers of the Church of England. Whether that is in full stipendary ministry or whether that is in the chaplains. In fact, in chaplaincy, those who are involved in different chaplaincies in hospitals and in universities, the average age or the highest uh, band of people is in the age of 75 to 79. Those are the people the Church of England is relying on to uh, grow its church. Now, if you look generally now at the, the bigger picture in the last year, the last 10 years, and you compare the baptisms and thanksgiving, uh, baptism and thanksgiving for children in the last uh, 10 years, then in 2008, you had 140,000 people coming forward uh, to give thanks for their children or to baptize them. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, that figure has gone down by approximately 40,000 people. So you now have roughly uh, 95,000 people coming forward to baptize their children and to give thanks for uh, their little children as well. So, so there's a huge decline. So just using that statistic alone, if you say that the number of baptisms have declined by um, 140,000 minus, um, say, 140,000, what's that, what's that in percentage terms? And, and you say, if that has happened in, 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 in 10 years, how many more years do you need in order for that to be completely extinct, for there to be zero baptisms in the Church of England? And I would say maybe another, another 15 years, and you have no baptism in the Church of England again. You look at the number of funerals uh, 10 years ago, you had about 180,000 people working in Church of England funeral. Now you have approximately 125. So now people no longer think or feel they want a Church of England funeral or are no longer members of Church of England, so they, they're not there to have their funeral in church. So again, if we keep going like that, yes, people continue to die. There should be no reason why the number of funerals decrease, but even funerals are decreasing in the Church of England. 
If you look at the number of marriages, 10 years ago, those 55,000 marriages being, being conducted in the Church of England. Now, we have just under 35,000 marriages being conducted in the Church of England. Give it another 10 years, you'll have no, no, no marriage sorry, being conducted uh, in the Church of England. So there's been a steady decline in baptisms, in funerals, and in marriages, so that if you keep going on this trend, there will be no more baptism, marriages, and funerals to conduct. So just using those statistics, we can see that um, the story is very bleak, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to um, stem that growth or decline. Uh, the question is, what, what, what can be done? What can we do to try and, and stem that decline? And the answer may be nothing. There's nothing we can do because it's, we, we've got to a point where we are completely overwhelmed and we should be glad that we still have a church and pray that we retire before you, know, you get to zero, but just hang around. <laughs> hang around until it's your time to leave and you just pray that you know, by the time you're leaving, there's still a bit more left for somebody else to, to finish out. But this, this, the story is very, very bad. And I think that, um, that we, we just need to uh, give it a serious look. But the amazing thing is that despite this declining statistics, that there has been no serious statement from the leaders of our church on this decline because it's seen as a, as a spreading, being a prophet of doom. If you speak about this decline in figures, that somehow we're just supposed to keep going and maintaining. Uh, the Church of England has this strategic uh, development fund that um, is investing huge amounts of money in trying to, to stay in that decline. I don't know whether it's working, but they investing huge amounts of money, millions of pounds in trying to create what you call resource, resourcing hub churches that are meant to go out and really do serious mission. And my church is one of those that has been given huge amounts of money in order to try and sustain that uh, decline. There's a focus as well on trying to get a more UK and E people into the church of England. You could say that maybe the the ship has already sailed on, on that issue because the UK ME people who were really committed to the Church of England in the early 60s and 50s did not receive a very warm welcome and have gone off and formed their own churches that are now thriving and doing very well compared to the Church of England. Or the answer might be just to say, okay, we're grateful for the number of people that we have in the Church of England at the moment. And then instead of trying to grow wider, we will go deeper as the Bishop of Oxford says, that this is a time to deepen our faith rather than widen our faith. What is normally said about the church in Africa is that it's, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. But now you have, um, uh, some people will say the time has come for the Church of England to, uh, to deepen rather than worry about the width of the number of, of, of the people in the Church of England. So I'm saying, and let me say it again as I conclude, that the Church of England will be wiped out in the next 15 to 20 years unless something really drastic happens. And I say this based on the Church of England statistics on mission and finance and ministry, and by comparing the trend for the last 10 years from 2008 to 2018, which only indicates a rapid decline. And then finally, just to say a proverb, uh, a Jewish proverb that says, uh, words should be weighed, not counted. And I believe that um, uh, this, this, this are very heavy words that I'm saying, but I'm not saying them as an outsider, I'm saying them as one who is involved in the whole activity of mission. And that we're all responsible and we all need to do something by the grace of God to try and rescue, rescue our beloved Church of England. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, at, per usual, um, we will open it up for comments and questions. If you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little button called uh, Reactions. And if you click on that, it'll say Raise Hand. So you'll see a hand go up, and then I can um, recognize you. And then you can unmute your mic, and then you can ask Tim a question. 
I'll start things off as I usually do. And uh, first, thank you, Tim. And I, those are dire statistics. A um, couple questions on that. Has that been what you've seen in the Church of Slough? Mm -hmm. Has your church significantly declined um, over your time in ministry, or has it been against the curve in that regard? And I say that in, with it in mind that I've been now in Oxford for a number of years, and I attend the church here in St. Andrews, and in terms of that and St. Ebbs and also St. Aldate's, that those numbers have held pretty steady. And in fact, St. Andrews may has grown slightly. I would say that if you went a year ago to today, that's 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 a that's a bad stat because people wouldn't attend because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So so we only had like yeah. 20 chairs set up a year ago, and you'd have to go sit and separate. And we were really encouraging people not to come. But just in terms of what you've seen, has that been your experience of a rapid decline of the church or, or not? Not in terms of the official numbers, but in terms of what you've actually observed in your own church. So I'm based in Slough, which is a, a part of the Diocese of Oxford. And, and this church, looking at the statistics in the last 10 years, has declined from an average Sunday attendance of 350 to something like 60 to 70 when I arrived. Wow. Well, so that's a massive decline. So it was a huge decline, really. And fortunately, uh, thank you know, grateful for all the people who work with me there. We have now moved in the last 18 months. The congregation has increased from 60 to 175 on the Sunday. So half of that. In, in about eight, in, in about eighteen months, so we we have a goal to try and increase the um, the Sunday Sunday attendance. That's the figure we 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 use to measure whether we're growing or or, or declining. And our plan is to get back to three hundred and fifty within five years. Okay. So overall, looking at Slough, uh, Slough has has um, a, a, a Sunday attendance of one point four percent of the population of Slough go to church. Yeah on a Sunday, Church of England, the other churches as well, but 1.4% go to church or on a Sunday. And the plan is to try and increase that. So there's been a decline generally, and uh, nationally speaking, and in, in Slough, but we've been blessed that so much has happened in, in, in our church in the last 18 months. Um, let's first go up on the screen then, David, I'll catch you. Is that Usha? Yeah, go ahead and unmute and, and, and go ahead and talk, Usha. Hello, hello, yes, it is me. Um, I noticed some interest in um, what you said about the UK ME. Um, there are more people uh, being ordained into the Anglican churches from the UK ME than ever before. In addition, I have found, um, and I, Tom, going to the same church as you, Tom, that the increase in the number of young families there is astounding. Um, yes. So many children and young families there. It is um, it, there is a definite growth there, an undeniable growth there. Um, and thirdly, I have found that most of the Anglican churches, um, yes, there were mistakes made in the past, but bridges have not been burned because they are working more closely with minority groups than they did before. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um... Yes, I, I, I agree that there is um, there are more uh, UK ME people being being ordained in the Church of England. That, that's probably something that has really increased in the last, um, uh, I would say, five years. And I'll tell you, I was ordained in the Church of England in 1997. And at that point in, in, in London, diocese that had 680 uh, priests, there was, there was only two UK ME uh, priests, me and, and and the current bishop bishop of uh, of Woolwich, were the two black people being ordained. So looking at that, something has happened over the last twenty five years. Although I must add again that uh, that that yes, the Church of England keeps saying that they're working hard on the UK me front, but this is something that's just changed in the last five years. And all credit to the current Archbishop of Canterbury. If you think to yourself, and I've been around the Church of England long enough to know. 
that uh, when Archbishop Santum was made bishop in um, going back 30 years ago, that it took about 25 years to appoint another black bishop. Mm. So, so it's, it's, it's not as, as wonderful as it looks. Sometimes it thinks, okay, if you get a black bishop in, you know, in York, then you know, you've solved the UK me issue. So I, 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 would, I would agree with you that things are changing and they're probably getting better. And the current goal is to have about 14% uh, of uh, UK, of our priests being of UK me, and, and hope that that will reflect at all levels of, 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 of church government, if you like. But we're still a long way to go, but it's much better, we're in a better place compared to where we were when I was ordained uh, about 25 to 30 years ago. Going back to the second question of, of, of families, yes, uh, some churches have a, an increase of young people coming in, but it tends to be the churches that are in the sort of rural or semi-rural areas, if you go to urban areas where people are running away from the urban areas because it's a, they think it's a dangerous place to raise up their children, you will have a decrease in children rather than an increase in children. And sometimes you have an increase in children, which is sort of the primary school age. But as soon as they get to university, the young people, the youth that go to university, they all disappear off. And you never see them again. So it's, it's a sort of, yeah... A, different picture depending on where you are, whether you're in a rural area or a semi-rural area. And yes, the Church of England is trying to work hard with UK. I mean, one of the things that, that I, one responsibility I've been given uh, in, in the Oxford Diocese and in, in Slough is to try and encourage uh, uh, vocations among UK me people. And that's sort of a special responsibility I've been given. And we're working very hard on that. We're hoping to increase our, 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 our numbers in the, in the coming uh, coming years. But you'll be surprised to hear that nobody, for example, in the Diocese of Oxford knows how many UK me priests we have. Not even the bishop himself knows how many UK me bishop, uh, priests we have in this diocese because they don't count. And it's, it's, it's voluntary to give those kind of statistics. But things should get better, we hope. All right. So I'm, I'm not good with names. Who is uh, Mr. Patel? First Harish. Harish. Harish Patel, please unmute and ask your question, Harish. So yeah, hi, uh, uh, the doctor team, and it's great to hear. I am I have almost come into this <laughs> accidentally because I didn't get the email till just a few minutes before two. Uh, so anyway, I'm I'm grateful for your presentation, and I would love to have a link to the statistics. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not very far from you, uh, team. I'm in yes. West London area, Hanslow which is almost right. just a few 10 miles or so. Uh, my, my question would be for a starter is, you know, the decline is, is both spiritual and, and what we call community-based. You know, if you don't find people are being genuinely welcome and there is even a whiff of partiality, people vote with their feet uh, and, and they won't come back. And I think one of the things I've been in church work for almost 23 years in mainly London area. I'm not, I'm part of, not part of an Anglican church, but I work with Anglican churches in various parts of London. Uh, and one of the things is there's always an elephant in the room. And I think that has been never tackled. You know, when I mean elephant in the room, there are some serious community issues which people have an underlying current and mainly ME people, minority ethnic communities will not raise an issue because they are afraid of many things beyond okay. that. And it is, it is, I think the peers, the superiors have to recognize that and even invite that kind of understanding for mutuality. So I, I agree with you, you know, putting a, a black brown person in a position does not sort it out. Like you just mentioned Bishop Santamu 30 years ago or so, it didn't sort it out. And I think there's a lot of superficial veneer fixing things that is going on. There's not underlying deep core heart and spiritual issues being identified and tackled. So 
uh, I, this is not for you to comment, but I'm just saying there is underlying things like that. And one big thing is you are in Slough, and I would say the same for West London area, maybe a lot of London areas, the community has vastly changed. For example, Slough would be probably 60% non-white. If you do not have integral part of mission to cross culture and cross religions as part of your church work, you are not going to make any progress anytime soon. Because even those people who are in your church, they will get sooner or later in, in tension with those communities. And it is usually, they will fight, but they will be having a flight. So they will move to a, some rural church in some area and not, because unless we teach them engagement, holistic engagement, there is not going to be much even retaining. I'm glad that you are seeing some growth. So I would ask you, what is your plan for missional, missioning Slav in the cross-religion, cross-culture way? Mm -hmm. So, so thank, thank you, Patel. Uh, just, just to encourage you a bit, uh, I was born in Kenya, and I uh, went I'm with Kenyan too. I was born in Kenya. How about you? I'm so yes. sad, but I went. I, I lived in, in in flats that were built by Mr. Patel, and I went. Mm. I, I went. I went to. I went to school uh, that was was run by by the Patel, you know, community as well. So you're 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 my favorite uh, listener today. Uh, so, but thank you very much. Yes, yes. Slough at the moment has changed. Uh, in, in our church and in, in Slough, St. Paul Slough, we have 60% Asians and mainly Pakistanis and, and, and Indians. And then we have about 15% Africans and then about 15, 10 to 15% English people. So when you come to Slough, our church is St. Paul Slough, when you talk about UK me, you're not talking about Asians or Africans, you're talking about white people, white English people. Uh, the UK me uh, as, as, as it calls now. They don't like it because it's it's for them it's offensive to even refer to them as being UK me. But I say to them in our church that the people I need to protect and ensure feel part of this church are the English rather than than the Africans and, 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 and the Asians. Amen. But <laughs> but, but the other thing that uh, that we are working very hard on since I arrived at, uh, at St Paul's is that we, we, we have stopped talking about multi-ethnic and multicultural congregation. We now refer to ourselves as an intercultural mm. worshiping community. And the idea is that if you have people of different cultures and different ethnicities, ethnicities together, the first thing you want to work on is to integrate them rather than have them existing in their own different ghettos in the church. When I arrived at this church, this was the norm. You know, you had services that were all white and you had services that were all Asian. People were very happy, but they didn't want that to change. But I have tried to change that. But now we have services that are completely mixed. You have different kinds of people living from the front. We even sing Urdu songs. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do is, is, you know, introduce people to different foods. You know, we had conflict on food, for example. You know, you have an Indian curry and all the English people say, oh, I don't eat curry. And then you you know you have a, a you know you have salads for for lunch and all the Indians say that's not proper food. So, <laughs> so, so we're trying very hard to integrate people on, on those very basic things uh, because we think you know, that if you're going to be a proper Christian church, a worshiping community under Jesus, then you need to bring people together and you need to work on the whole issue of integrating people first and foremost. And you integrate and you unite behind Jesus Christ. And not anything else. Let not our food, not our dresses, not our language. All those things should not really uh, break us. We should work hard on integrating, and that's how I think the white people will feel welcome, and the Asian people will feel welcome, and the Africans and all ethnicities will feel will feel welcome in our church. So I agree with you entirely that we need to look at the things that really matter to all the various cultures and ethnicities in our church. Mm -hmm. Good, Andrew. Welcome. Thank you are you much. coming in from Toronto or are you coming in from Oxford? <laughs> I'm coming in from Toronto, Tom. Hello. Nice to see everybody this morning <laughs> and to all my friends there. Um, thank you for this presentation. And I'm afraid to say that 
many of the themes that Tim has mentioned today uh, echo in the Canadian church. And, um, and I'm afraid that uh, the same sort of decline is being experienced in the mainline churches here. But I have a very specific question for Tim, and that is in relation to uh, the church moving forward now and, and your dire prediction about its survival, Tim, to what extent do you think theological education and the formation of clergy in the light of this decline needs to change? Um, and to what extent do you think the Holy Spirit can use that change uh, to, in fact, reverse or to allow for a renewal of the church, a spiritual renewal, a theological renewal of the church? Because it seems to me that a lot of theological education is still bogged down in issues that are often related to the past and are not really missional. Um, and yet at the same time needs to be grounded in, in solid theology and a solid Christology. And as Damon would say, a solid Trinity. So um, to what extent do you think theological formation needs to change to really take on this challenge as well? Okay, thank you very much. I uh, just to tell you that Andrew, um, although I'm an Anglican, I was born an Anglican, uh, when I was a teenager, I rebelled and then ended up in a Pentecostal church. So I do believe that the Holy Spirit exists, actually. <laughs> and I, I think that, that, that you, you know, you ignore the Holy Spirit at, at your own peril. So when I, when I became, uh, um, in fact, when I wanted to be ordained as a, as a Church of England minister, I felt that I hadn't quite given the Holy Spirit space in my life. So I sneaked back to Kenya and went to a Pentecostal church that I'd gone to as a teenager and said, can you, you know, give me a proper baptism of Holy Spirit so that I can really go back and be ordained and do this work properly. I know theologically that might have some difficulties. People might have difficulty with that. But the whole idea of being baptized in the Spirit and, and um, or even being baptized twice. But I just felt it was important to acknowledge the Holy Spirit in everything that I was doing. And so in my ministry, I tried very hard to uh, invite people to allow the Holy Spirit to move. I mean, I'm talking about this declining decline of the Church of England. I'm talking about this, I'm almost like the prophet of doom. But I believe that if we trust the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to move and renew us, that all this doom story that I'm talking about can actually change. Mm -hmm. So it's not up to me, really, to sort of predict where the Church of England is going to be in the next 20 years. But it's up to God and the Holy Spirit. And we need to give God the space to be able to do the things it needs to do. And we need to focus on the issue, the real issue of mission, the great commission that God has, has given to us. And I find that one of the biggest challenges we have at the moment, first of all, is with the training of the ministers that we have, that um, having changed, and, and as, as I speak as a principal, a former principal of a theological college as well, that we have somehow decided that, that rather than train people properly, rather than form them properly, that we're going to work hard on trying to cut the cost and the time of training and formation. So we're almost doing like a crash program where we don't think it's important for people to sort of grow into the position of being a minister of the gospel in the church. And so we want to get them out as quickly as possible and we want to get them doing things as quickly as possible. But in the process, we don't allow them to listen to the Holy Spirit and we don't allow them to, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to move them. But the other thing we've done, or the Church of England has done as well, is almost shift the agenda for the minister now. In the Church of England, you hear more about issues such as safeguarding than you hear about the gospel and the Holy Spirit. You hear more uh, about you know, contemporary issues about sexuality and that kind of thing that, in a sense, I think are a destruction. So we're spending too much time on discussing these issues that then uh, distract us from the gospel itself. So I think the training is wrong. I'm not in a position to, to change that because I know the Church of England has gone through a transformation in the last uh, 10, 15 years of trying to cut costs and trying to make it easier for people to train. But I think what you have in the process is that you're producing half-baked ministers and gospel ministers who don't really believe in that gospel that they are meant to go out and share with other people. So you have a very weak force out there trying to do a task that is almost impossible 
You don't want feeble ministers out there who have lost confidence in the gospel, who uh, who think it's more important to be uh, politically correct than, than to actually remain faithful to God. People have lost confidence in the gospel. And these are the people we're putting in charge of churches to try and grow the church. Well, you can only get declined in that situation. Damon, yeah. and then we'll go to Tim. Yeah, so thank you for coming back, um, Tim. We were students here together, and so I'm so very happy to see you back here. Good and good. we're in the same, same seminar room talking yes. again. Yes. Um, so you've given us a lot of statistics. I just want to check whether my understanding is correct. So over the over a 10 year period, 2008 to 18, there's been a steady decline, but the decline has been accentuated by the pandemic. Yes. Is that the general threat thing? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, the, the question in my mind is, it must be, you know, kind of also appear in other people's mind. Is what, what, are, what are the factors causing this, you know, steady decline? And, and what are the major things that we need to look at and to tackle? In order to kind of slow down the decline or reverse the decline, well, I mean, uh, Andrews mentioned about theological education. Um, we mentioned about incorporating uh, ethnic minorities in, in one way or another. <laughs> so, what are the things that we need to be doing in order to do that? In order to grow the church? Well, I, I think that the point made by um, it was under, I think, about theological education is very important. So I speak as a theological educator myself, you know, having, and then as a bishop, having seen how, how hopeless some of the ministers can be after they come out of college, but having trained them myself, I, I, I think I'm, I'm very proud of my own training record as a, as a theological educator. And, and the people I trained always went on and excelled, actually. Yeah. And that I'm very pleased about. But I think uh, the biggest problem is, is that we're in a crisis as a church, mm -hmm. speaking of the Church of England. And when, when you're in a crisis, when you're trying to make decisions in a crisis, you're more likely to make a wrong decision than the right one. So there's a crisis of, of, of decline, and therefore, mm -hmm. and decline is on numbers, as well, as well as numbers of people coming forward to do ministry, but also on the resources available to prepare these people for ministry. And then the, the anxiety that people are finding more interesting things to do in church uh, than come to church. So we have multiple issues around us. And because of that, we're not able to make the right decision, which should be. But if you want to have good, strong fighting troops, then you want to invest enough time in training and forming, forming them theologically. You want to ensure that they have confidence in, in the gospel, in the scriptures, that they know exactly what to do, that they understand what is involved in serving God in, in, in the churches. That, I think, has been thrown out completely because mm -hmm. we, we, haven't got, we haven't got the money to do it properly. Most of what used to be the full-time theological colleges have turned to part-time theological colleges now. And so you don't have that close formation and close interaction of people that, that helps you form the character and the stamina and the perseverance of ministers who then need to go out and do that work in a way that would, would, you know, would be more effective. So you, you're producing half-baked ministers, if you like. So the, the first problem, I think, is fix this theological training and formation. That, for me, would be the first stage. And then return to the basics. Stop wasting your time on issues that, um, that are not helping the gospel. Yes, they may be important, but they, they're not issues that will, will grow the church. Uh, as an evangelical in the Church of England, I will tell you that the whole issue of human sexuality has completely overwhelmed the church. That now an evangelical Christian in the UK believes that the only thing that will keep them relevant or keep them faithful to the gospel if they if they stood firm on a particular position on human sexuality. I think from my Pentecostal um, instincts, that's the devil distracting us, just giving us, allowing us to spend all our energy on, on this one issue to the point where even evangelicals themselves are beginning to break into pieces because they think, oh, you're not firm enough on scripture. Your view is not as solid as, as, as it needs to be. So we've, we've allowed ourselves to be distracted on issues that are not really that relevant. Uh, and just going back to what uh, Patel was saying, maybe if we spend a bit more time on just listening to the Holy Spirit, 
you spend a bit more time on on building community, on on helping us, you know, be a proper fellowship and do the things that Christians need to do. Maybe we would build a stronger church and we'd have more troops to do the work that uh, that uh, that needs to be done. I, I see your metaphor of army and should you uh, in <laughs> army before yeah? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, chapel, the army. Yeah, we're gonna go with Tara, please, Tara. Thank you so much for sharing today. I think that we're having a lot of these conversations. I have the privilege of marrying into a family where my my grandfather-in-law has been ministering 69 years. Wow. And uh, he's celebrating his 91st birthday, 69th right. year next month. And, you know, he, so he has the perspective of a few generations. Mm-hmm. And the things that he always boils it down to is he always encourages us as, as his grandchildren to, to realize that this is one of the first generations where we're ministering to four or five generations within one church, mm-hmm. as well as all the ethnicities coming together. And so he always just kind of reminds us about that, re- to remind, to be reminded of the different expectations of all of those generations of what they're coming to the church to receive mm-hmm. and to try to make some provisions for each one, although all are going to be required to give a little bit, to have not the perfect worship experience if they're going to worship in a multi-generational church. Mm-hmm. And then the multi-ethnic church, he always just kind of excuses as, well, the early church was a multi-ethnic church. They figured it out by the spirit and, mm-hmm. We'll figure it out too, but to be very intentional, as you're saying um, that you're doing, and including all the different cultures and teaching the appreciation for one another. But through the pandemic, he says exactly what I think we're all saying, kind of pointing to here: pastoral care wins the day. And that's precisely what we're talking about. The thing that he panics about is not the decline. He panics about the quality of the ministers coming out, that they're unprepared to face these very difficult things. So I look at him, how he deals with human sexuality and whatever. He just doesn't even, he was more concerned about the person yeah. than the issue. Yeah, yeah. And so because of that, he feels so comfortable. You wouldn't think somebody in their 90s would be so comfortable with the extremes of sexuality that we're facing um, today, but he is because he's looking at the person and he yeah. knows how to pastor a person. Yeah. And so I think that that's precisely his panic um, when he looks at our generation and even coming a generation behind us as like, you all don't know what it takes to pastor a community. You don't know what it takes to show up in the middle of the night to take your calls from people who don't attend your church, yeah. just people who need pastoral care in crisis moments of their life. And then suddenly their whole family is coming to the church because they've met a a felt need. And so I think that's precisely what you're saying is that the theological training, and maybe we're even doing better at the theological part, but the formation, the spiritual formation that you're pointing Mm -hmm. out is kind of what I think we're seeing globally across churches in general. Can we, can we train people to be more like Jesus, to be more pastoral in everybody's lives, not just in the lives of the people that are, paying tithes and attending your church. If you can really pastor a community, you can grow a community church. So, so just, just to agree with you, uh, one, of, one of the things I've done in the church that I'm looking at after in Slough is that every, every Tuesday afternoon we have a staff meeting. And every Tuesday afternoon, I expect every staff member of the team to report on the people they have visited or spoken to on the phone. Yeah. And then each, each week we, we ask every staff member, there's about five of them, to make a commitment on the people they're going to see. So pastoral care is at the core of, of many, especially during this, this COVID season. So I agree with you entirely that, you know, the way to sustain the church and grow it is to take care of your people pastorally. And that has to be taught, like yes, you're saying. It has to be taught. Accountability yeah. to do I mean, I, I, one of the staff members just said, no, we can't do that. And you from Africa, you have no idea how to do <laughs> pastoral care. He said, no, we're going to do it. That's all we're doing about. Okay, we're here from David and then back up to Usha. Yeah, we have a very close friend of ours, uh, Tom Rosenbaum, in Hudson, um, So he was a, a very senior bishop uh, in the Church of England. He uh, chose to leave the church and join the, um, the Catholic Ordinary, mm-hmm. Anglican Ordinary. Yeah. Um, that, that was uh, pretty sad, not just for him, but for most of others who are closely associated with him. But he was deeply, deeply. Uh, disaffected with the church because of what's going on in, in, in the church. But, but these statistics that you presented are presumably from the yes, Anglican yes, sources. Yes. 
And I'm just wondering what the Anglican Church is actually doing with the, the reports that they have produced uh, more systematically and more broadly in the church and not just in Slav, where, where you are located. And secondly, because you speak the way you speak, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that you speak about these things in other uh, forums as well, how, how are you received by the Church of England? As an as an institution, uh, you still have the job, so it <laughs> 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 looks like they're tolerating you. <laughs> but so so just because you're possible, the, the mutual friend that you have with Tom is a mutual friend of mine. <laughs> I, I still haven't had the courage to call him and ask him why he left, because <laughs> I, I I was so heartbroken when he decided to go. Because for me, he was also like a sort of somebody I looked to to inspire me, and I thought you know he was holding the line very well, and so I was really sad to see him go. And I just, you know, have, haven't had the courage to to uh, to, co to call him and say what 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 really brought him to that point. But in in terms of uh, the statistics, uh, one one of the disappointing things is the Church of England will invest a lot of money in producing the statistics and even collecting them. It takes a whole six or seven months mm. to collect and compile yeah. and write these reports, and then they put them. Uh, show them. They show them. Wow. So, well, well they, they're on the website, you know, typical Church of England style, you know, you know where they are. So, you know, you go and look for them and find them if you want to read them. But for me, I, I would say that this is the kind of thing that, that needs to be out there and everybody needs to see this. And, and we need to pray about it because I'll say it's not just our own energy or ability that will help us, you know, turn this corner. We all need to pray about this thing. We all need to put them before God and we all need to say to, us, to God, what do you want us to do? And the things that we're supposed to do are just so simple things. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we complicate ministry mm -hmm. and we make it look like it's it's you know you need it's rocket science. It's not rocket science, really. It's just the basic things that people need to do. We're dealing with human beings. Uh, we're not we're not dealing with with right. um, you know, and, and sometimes I say it, not not everybody in the congregation has a PhD. So you don't have to get it to that level where where you're talking PhD language to people, you just need to speak the basic language. And do that, but there's this, there's almost like like a destruction where there's so much happening in the Church of England at the moment that this kind of thing, even though they invest a lot of money in it, is somehow doesn't get to to, to be aired properly, mm -hmm. and the people who need to be sitting down and spending hours just digesting this information and praying about it haven't got the time to do it because they are held up by all other issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. So all we can do is just pray. But somehow, um, how do you explain the fact that you know they they've got a report like this before them, yet they they, they ignore it? Uh, why why are they doing it? Are they not aware of the fact that the church is likely to cease to exist? So all you have to do, if if, if you're my age and you say you you say fifteen to twenty years, well, I'll be gone you're within fifteen. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're it's safe. So, it's, 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 you're safe. <laughs> it's the prayer of Eli. So long as it doesn't happen in my generation. Yeah. So, <laughs> is it not because uh, the Church of England is, uh, in a sense, the state church? So it is the state church. Whether there are people in the pews or not, yeah. they, the church is going to survive because it has the support of the state. They, they think so, but I, 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 I think over the last 50 years, uh, things are being chipped away as slowly. For example, now, just take something that people haven't realized as has happened. So now a Church of England minister no longer has a monopoly to do weddings, for example. You no longer have the monopoly to do funerals. And, and we no longer now issue marriage certificates in church. Those are now issued by the registrar. Okay. So that's power that's been taken away from us. So that privileged position means nothing to us. So once they take away all these things, who knows, the next King of England might not be crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury. They might just say, oh, we want him crowned by um, everybody. Multi-faith group. A multi-faith group. So, so we've lost that privileged position and somehow we think it's really, really important to hold on to. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other things that being the established church um, means that you know we, we, we're spending our time doing. Issues, issues such as safeguarding, for example, I mean, I think a bishop is going to be more frightened by a safeguarding report than a mission statistics report. Yeah. Right, right. Because, because the, the, the safeguarding report might get him into jail, you know, yeah, get him into jail. It's, it's, it's but but the, the decline of the church isn't going to get anybody <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we're going to go with Usha, right, uh, mute, and then we'll go with Ben. 
Um, I just want to make a comment about the um, things that you said about safeguarding, that the church is spending too much time on it. And yeah. I kind of find that a very alarming remark because actually the church should be on the forefront of safeguarding if they were doing pastoral care well and if they have appropriate theological education. So I think um, a lot of people have left the Church of England because of safeguarding issues. And while it's very sad that funerals, um, weddings, all of these things appear to be taken away from the church by um, government rules, regulations, changes, if we're not doing what we should do to take care of those that are part of our congregations, part of the Anglican congregations, or even, dare I say, part of the evangelical congregations, because there is just as much abuse amongst Pentecostals, African, Asian, or otherwise, as there is anywhere else. It's just that we're very clever at hiding it, and we seem to be able to avoid those things. So I think to think that safeguarding is actually preventing the church from growing is that is actually wrong so uh, thank you Usha and this is not the first time I have said this and 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 I always get the reaction that I've got from you I'm not saying that safeguarding is wrong I think as a church we need to ensure that the people that God has given to us are looked after and are well protected but all I'm saying is that if we're going to spend all this energies on safeguarding alone, how about spending about 20% of that energy on issues of mission and the gospel? But by the way, if you spend more energies on gospel, teaching people the gospel, explaining what the gospel means, then the gospel itself is a safeguarding document, if you like. Because if you're going to do things according to the gospel, then safeguarding will be taken care of. But I'm not sitting here encouraging anybody to neglect what we are required to do in terms of safeguarding because I think people need to be protected. And yes, the church has been a place where people have been abused as well. So I'm not here to promote, you know, uh, help people or tell people to ignore uh, the safeguarding rules that have been set for us. I just think that some of the rules that the Church of England brings down on people are, are in a sense, restraining us from concentrating on the main gospel, which is uh, helping to, to share Jesus Christ. But do not for a moment assume that I'm saying this is all useless. I know it's caused a lot of damage and it's still causing damage in for people who were abused, say 50, 60 years ago, it still, has, it still has repercussions for them. And I know in Canada and other places, the church has suffered worse than it has in England, actually. And can I, I'd just like to say that like Harish Bhai Patel, I am also Gujarati, also Patel ah, um, by right. birth. And I came to faith I went to a Church of England school in the West Midlands. I was born in England. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm evangelical. I, I go to St. Andrews um, sometimes when I'm in town. Um, I've been a missionary for 34 years. So it's, it's not that I don't understand the issue of mission and the gospel, but I feel like if the church had been on the forefront of safeguarding, I shouldn't say had been, I should say continues to be, needs to be now. Not, not just in the Anglican churches, not just in the um, set up churches as they are, but even in the small groups that meet, if they are on the forefront of safeguarding along with the gospel, that will encourage mission more than any of our things that it's, you know, it's about slotting our percentage of times in. I am still a full-time missionary. I am, you know, a PhD student at OCMS. I am a convert from Hinduism, but I don't honestly think that we can put the nails in the coffin of the Anglican church um, without taking other things into consideration. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming you're younger than me, so you've got longer to, to serve in the Church of England. Doubtful. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> 60 next year, so I doubt 60. that I'm 60. <laughs> Let's go with Ben Quay. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I was just going to say, um, to preface, I was the special assistant for the Anglican um, Archbishop of the Diocese of Southeast Asia, John Ju, for a period of time, and I have been Anglican for some time. Um, and a lot of what you shared is actually very 
much on our hearts out in out in the Archbishop Archdiocese, uh, in out in the Diocese of Southeast Asia as well. But I just want to say that um, I totally agree with you saying that we should be spending more time and attention on some on some other more important issues than what we are now. That I agree. Um, but I do have an issue with um, measuring church growth by numbers, um, even though I'm sure you were trying to make a point with the percentages and the numbers that you brought up. Um, also that, you know, when I, was, when I was special assistant with the Archbishop, we saw parishes die. We saw parishes um, get stagnant. We saw other parishes grow. We saw other parishes um, reduce in size, but ended up starting a brand new ministry in a certain area that was really strategic. And, uh, and where we saw the entire body, not just the, the um, you know, um, Singapore, but the entire uh, Archdiocese of Southeast Asia, um, you know, we realized that there are, there are times, there are seasons as well in, in churches and, and, and parishes. And some, some parishes don't grow, uh, die, shrivel out, you know, as what um, Patel said, you know, because of people issues, because of, of, of poor leadership, um, not necessarily because of the faith or, or anything or the church per se. And people who leave uh, um, a second tier city to go to a first tier city for work, for example. And so you're not really losing um, people in the congregation, they're just moving from one parish to another parish because of people movements and, and all that. And so I think in the larger aspect of, of being bishop and looking at the entire diocese and, and the various dioceses that are under uh, your charge, um, it'll be interesting to see where the Church of England is growing in terms of new initiatives, in terms of strategic um, starts, which, which, which would never have happened um, not necessarily seeing the numbers yet, but something that, you know, that, that hasn't been done before. And also to um, look at, as you said, the areas where we are not growing or we are dying or shrinking in numbers and saying, what are the issues there? Is it just because we're not paying a folk an attention on the gospel? Or is it because of weak uh, clergy training? Or is it because of um, people issues on the ground that the clergy doesn't know how to deal with? And, and we've had really small parishes which struggle because the poor cl clergy was you know, fresh out of college, really young, and didn't know how to handle people issues, and just couldn't handle human resources um, or, 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 or conflicts in the church. And, and everybody else in the diocese was busy with all the initi other initiatives to mentor him, for example. Um, so I think that there are really practical issues, but I just wanted to take away the focus on um, the Church of England dying because of numbers dwindling, and to say the initiatives I've heard just being in England, even on this call, initiatives in intercultural, um, reaching out to Punjabis and reaching out to um, uh, Ukrainians. And I mean, all of that are wonderful initiatives, which, which I'm, I'm sure is where the church grows and that's where the, the shoots come from. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, from a more interdenominational angle, um, the Church of England institutionally might, might shrivel, but it might mean that our believers go to other um, uh, friends in the other denominations that grow a lot more. And ultimately it is the larger church uh, that we are looking to grow. And there are issues around a national church, a state church, um, uh, uh, an establishment church that, that shackles it probably a lot more than, than others that might not have to deal with some of the baggages and history that, that drags the Church of England down. Um, and my, my last point is the Church of England has spawned the, um, um, the Global South. And a lot of the Global South was well, not necessarily in the South anymore. A lot of the Global South are Anglican churches that are thriving. And these are the fruits of the Church of England's labor. Um, and, and all of that is worth rejoicing um, because of the times. And maybe the Church of England is going through lean times when God is still there in the valley. Um, and we want to rejoice at all the small little shoots and not measure growth by numbers or growth by parishes that are dying or not. So just, just a quick look. Just a quick summary response to all that you said. Thank you, Ben. I think that's good. Thank, thank you very much, Ben. I just bl blend my whole focus on numbers or, or, on on uh, on Tom. <laughs> he's, he's American, and, and the Americans believe that the only way you can measure uh, mission success is <laughs> mission growth is 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 in numbers. So <laughs> don't get so, me started so, on American. Well, yeah, <laughs> What I would say, though, I, and, and, and maybe I'm the president or this way, but um, Ben, thank you. I and thank you for referring to my old boss. Uh, good to hear about John Chu and, and uh, tying that back together. What I would say is, and my challenge to you, um, Tim, would be 
Actually, you need academics and you need studies because it's one thing to bring up, and you're exactly right, and those are very important numbers to look at. But I, as an academic, would want to see what churches are growing. Mm -hmm. What are the dynamics of those churches? What kind of ministry emphases do they have? What are they finding that's working and not working? And I would like to see quantitative and qualitative analysis that can go along good training so that we're supplying our future pastors, leaders, Christian educators, not just with the good old gospel, what we've always known is true, da 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 da. No, what's actually working in a very changed situation? And I would suggest now is the moment to strike. Because yes, COVID has been a real blow to habitual going into churches. And I know this in my own family. Judy and I are nagging my children and grandchildren. Why aren't you in church? Mm. We're saying it very nicely. This <laughs> week, but we're going, oh, did, did Annie go to church this week? Oh, she did. Why not? Oh, well, and, and are you finding a church? Because we have gone through a two-year period yeah, yeah. where habitual grace has been lost, but it's an opportunity too. So I'd say that. The second thing I'd say in a life, uh, a life this is more uh, just occasional and something that I experienced, but Judy and I were part of a, it was called singles group. When we first met each other, we, we didn't end up singles, so maybe that's a decline. <laughs> but we were there when it went from about 30 persons to six. And it was about to vanish. And we got together and we prayed, but we also put together some strategy. Within six months, that group was 140 persons. Wow. All right. Now, part of the Holy Spirit, part of some good things that we did. But as one who serves as Savior, who everything thought was lost when he died, that God loves it when everybody thinks that, that it's, it's good for dead. Because Friday isn't the end of the story. Sunday is. All right. And we're about to face and celebrate the resurrection of God. Right, and you look through the history of the church, it is the point when it just about disappeared that it rose again from the dead and became a powerful force in the world. So, rather than seeing these things as just a matter of frustration and depression, I think we need to attend this Sunday and go, Lord, do it. <laughs> All right, it's time to see the resurrection. Of the dead. I stay at the Chinese church. Most people thought the Chinese church in 1972 had been wiped off the face of the earth. When the U.S. officials went to the Chinese authorities and said, you say you believe in freedom of religion, why don't you open up the churches? And they said, well, no one will come. There are no more Christians left in China. Hmm. But for your sake, you Americans, okay, we'll okay, open them. Lines were down the street, around the corner. They were the surrounded and the shocked the Chinese Communist Party so much that what they thought had they killed was bigger than anything they could handle. It is now and will be in the next 30, 40 years, the largest church of any nation in the world. You know, there's a the Chinese word for crisis mm. have two parts in it. The first part is danger. The second part is opportunity. opportunity. <laughs> Think about this. Mm. It's dangerous, but if we do the right thing, it can become an opportunity. An opportunity. Yeah, right. It's very interesting. Just two words. Yeah. One is danger, the other one is opportunity. Well, what, what I would say in that, thank you, Tim. I think, you know, I didn't know how it was going to turn out because partly my fault and my apologies <laughs> to everybody. This did come out at the last second. I thought it had gone out. And I started looking for the link and I couldn't find it. And that's my fault. I've been kind of, I've been in the hospital. So. But some people joined. And I think that the discussion we had, Tim, was absolutely excellent. I think that when this gets out there and people tune in on YouTube, it will spark some good interaction. So we are blessed by you, sir. And as we are by all our students and alumni and faculty and all of you who joined. So in that, um, Go to church on Sunday and, and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much. God bless.
But you didn't answer the question about how you're treated by the police. And obviously, you're well, because I'm an African, what you're because saying. I'm an African, I can always get away with all. <laughs> you, you 